from tomorrow. But now, let's talk about reintegration and rehabilitation of inmates. And it is a concern, basically, for some inmates who leave the prisons, whether they'll be accepted by the society and whether, you know, they will go back to their normal lives in terms of employment, in terms of being welcomed back by their families or friends. It is a discussion I want us to have with uh, two gentle ladies and, and a gentleman. And uh, Jane, sitting in on my immediate left is... Um, uh, Jen Kuria, the CEO of Faraja Foundation. She'll be telling us more about Faraja Foundation, what it does when it comes to rehabilitation and integration of inmates. Sitting next to Jane is uh, Bernard Oma, an engineer st uh, student who served a jail term for keeping a cache of uh, dangerous weapons at the University of Nairobi. And seated next to Bernard is Beatrice Muriu, who is a university student and uh, was, you know, accused of uh, stabbing her husband to death. Just talking to us about the life experience, how it has been. And just before I start with Jane, I'll need to start with um, Beatrice. Tell, about, tell us about, you know, your life in prison, how you ended up being in prison. Okay, thank you, and uh, I'm really grateful and feeling so awesome being here. Thank you for Varaja for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences and encourage somebody there out. So at the age of 16, just having those normal graduates with the parents, I ran away from home, and that's how I ended up in a man's house. And living together, there were some things that didn't go well, and one day we just had a fight of where he, just, he was fatally injured. And that's how I found my way to Rangato Women's Prison. And uh, prison life definitely is not easy. It is a hard and a tough moment for everybody. But uh, I, thank, uh, I thank Faraja because they are always there welcoming us even in prison and taking us through sexual social therapy where you are given us some guidance to help you understand and cope with the just the abrupt changes in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the age of, so we can say you got married at the, at the age of 16. Yes, I, ran, I was expelled from school. For, mm -hmm. I, okay, I just didn't like the school. That's why all things happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I, let me just go back a little. I just passed well, really well, in my KCP. I had uh, 406 marks, and I was admitted to three schools. So my, my parents chose Karima Girls over the other schools, owing mm -hmm. the fact that it was near my home. So to me, I just felt I did not settle. So I felt like I needed the best. I, I ought to have gotten something else which should have fit where, I'm, or should, where I should fit. Mm -hmm. So having those issues, that's why I came to Form 2 and I really became the bad girl. Mm -hmm. As much as I used to give the best performance, I also became this bad girl and the school could not contain me. So I had to be given an expulsion and that's why I ran away from home and found myself in the arms of this guy and uh, that's my transition from freedom now into an inmate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And th that's why you, you, you had a fight with yeah. your husband? Yes. And uh, stabbing happened and suddenly he died? Yes. Okay, Bernard. Talk to us about your you know, reasons as to why you were in prison because the information that we have, it's because you're containing some cache of weapons. Okay, first of all, I, I, I'd like to clarify something. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer a student. Mm -hmm. I'm, now, I'm, not, I'm working now. Mm -hmm. I graduated some time back. So before that, I was at the University of Nairobi. I was uh, proceeding well with, well with my studies. But now due to the fact that I came from a very humble background, uh, life at campus, most of us know that life there is uh, quite challenging. People want to live their lives that are not theirs. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually I was doing my other businesses, small businesses while still in, in campus. Mm -hmm. But then due to lack of quick cash, I found myself, in, I found, I found myself engaging with guys who are robbers. Mm -hmm. They would go and rob, then bring their firearms to the university and I would keep for them at mm -hmm. a fee. Mm -hmm. Then after, after... At what fee? At a fee. Of how much? They will give me, it will depend mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with whatever they will get from their mission. At some times, at, I would get 10,000, other times I would get even 20,000. Mm -hmm. So after like one year operating with them, uh, the police got an information and they came, led an ambush, and the guys were arrested. After that, I ran away. It, it didn't take long. Because uh, after exactly three weeks, I was also arrested in Lokichogyo, mm -hmm. flown back to Nairobi, then taken to court mm -hmm. and charged alongside all the other guys. So at that point when you're keeping these weapons for robbers, did your roommate know about it? I know he didn't know. He didn't know he about didn't, it. He didn't know. Then comes in Faraja Foundation. What do you do exactly? How do you work with the inmates? Okay, thanks Brenda for having us here. 
Uh, Faraja is a non-profit organization with a sole mission of rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders and ex-offenders. Rehabilitation happens inside the prison, reintegration is outside the prison. So we start our work in the prisons because that's where we met both uh, Beatrice and, uh, and Bernard. Once you are put behind bars, either waiting for your case, it's an extremely challenging situation. Mm -hmm. It's completely different. Your family is, can't see you as they wish and you find yourself in this setup. So people go through a lot of turmoil mm -hmm. and uh, that's where we come in. We provide counseling, we provide mentorship just to encourage you that uh, there's still life that continues. So in there we have different programs. Mm -hmm. Like for example, where Beatrice was in Langata Women, we have a resource center where has, which has counseling rooms, a library for just you to keep some sanity. The same case with committee where Bernard was. So when we met them, we work with them in the prison so that the time comes for you to leave we have an idea of where you come from, what are your challenges, because it's extremely challenging when you leave. Mm -hmm. uh, because first of all, the society, we are still not very friendly to ex-offenders. Mm -hmm. Second chances are very rare. So for example, uh, Beatrice was 16 when she was at Langata Women. So obviously school had stopped. So when she left, we offered her a scholarship to proceed with her education because her family was quite needy. So she finished that, now she's in university, is pursuing education at Kenyatta University. For Bernard, he left, when he left university, he, I mean, when he left the prison at committee, he was uh, taken back to university, but on condition, he couldn't live in the hostels, in the campus hostels. So obviously, again, because of the needy background, because Brenda, maybe just to mention, most people are in prison because of economic issues, mm -hmm. poverty, unemployment, so quick money, or you want some money. So for Bernard, he could not uh, stay in the hostels. The parents could not afford accommodation. So we came in, paid his rent for a whole year, mm -hmm. paid his food, gave him a laptop to, I mean, transport, yes, and gave him a computer to be able to proceed with his studies. So, so that they can be able to not be just like other students right. or other Kenyans. Right. So that's what we do for... For the, for the inmates. Yes. And, uh, you know, um, Beatrice, let me just, Ruby, let, let me bring you back into this conversation. When you're in prison, how, how, how are you, did your parents accept you after what happened and were they visiting you? And did you accept yourself? Um, at first it was hard for me to accept myself because um, you're, you're just there beginning with yourself with bringing, if I had, if I did this, if I did this. So then you just come to this point of uh, you're in denial. So there's a lot of turmoil that's going, that there is a lot in your mind. And that's how we get the cycle social. Then uh, my family became so supportive because I didn't mention this because when I was going there, I was, I was I think, three weeks to delivery. Mm -hmm. I was heavily pregnant, so my family just supported me. They even hired a lawyer for me, and I really thank them for that. But better still, there was that, okay, they did, them, they, they did that as a duty, as any parent would do for their loved one. Mm -hmm. But deep down my heart, I needed to just bring them closer. That's why one day I just went to Faraj's office, they in prison, and requested to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with my dad. He was uh, good enough and he came and uh, we had that talk mm -hmm. facilitated by the prison's welfare department and uh, Faraj in conjunction. So we had that and we just had to bury the hatchet so that mm -hmm. we can go back to where we were. Mm -hmm. So that I could make my dad understand that this is really what happened for me to be where I am. And I, I think when I was leaving the prisons and even when I was there, I felt at ease because of we had already breached the gap. So by the time you're going to Langata Women's Prison, how old were you? I was 16. You were 16? Yes. And you gave birth in the prison? Yes, I did. So where was your baby all this time? Um, I was taking, when I had my labor, I was, I was rushed to Kenyatta National Hospital and I delivered through a CS and I was taken back to the prisons. Although the first three months we were uh, young mothers, we are isolated uh, because of the congestion there inside and you are put somewhere separate. But after three months, you are, you are brought back. All right. Yeah. All right. And, and Bernard, mm -hmm. your story, you are arrested, taken to, you run away, you're arrested after three weeks, you take it to the prison. Did your parents know about it and how did they take it? Uh, they were really shocked because they never knew anything concerning me keeping the firearms while, I, while I, in college. So he was re my dad was really shocked. Uh, I, I remember when I, was in the, uh, when I was still in the police cells before taken to the courts, my dad came and actually he wept when he saw me behind the, behind the cells. 
After that, I just uh, told him that I did that due to greed for quick money, and I apologized for him because my dad had very high expectations on me. Being the first one in our family, I was doing a, a, a good cause, so he had very high hopes that maybe if I would graduate one day, I would help my siblings mm -hmm. to finish their studies. Mm -hmm. So when I was taken to committee, it, it didn't take long before he passed on, mm -hmm. but he was very supportive. So he passed on while in prison. Yeah. You didn't even go for the burial. I didn't. So, um, Jane, then how do you ensure that when inmates are there, you're working with them, how do you ensure that the family members accept them? Because it's one thing for the family members to accept them when they've been released mm -hmm. and also to accept them while they're in prison and to accept the offence that has been committed. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the prisons that we work with, we have counsellors, we have uh, mentors. So, we call what is mediation, call it mediation or reconciliation. So, we will talk to the parents, we shall just tell them, come and visit your family. And when, when need be, when they come, we sit together in a family conference so that people just share their issues. Sometimes we even try to reach the victims because that can be another challenge because the victims are somehow forgotten in these issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of follow-up that is done, phone calls, sometimes even visiting these homes so that we ensure that these people at least can see we are working with their family. And if us as outsiders are accepting your family, mm -hmm. then you should be able to accept them back. So it's a, it's a lot of work back and mm -hmm. forth. But it's very, very fruitful. It's very, very fruitful. Yeah. So now let's fast forward this, you know, um, uh, Beatrice, to that time now when you're almost leaving, you know, Langata Women's Prison. So for how long were you there? And were you looking forward to, you know, in reintegration with the community? And did you get, you know, um, there, Jen is talking about being in contact with the families of the, with the family of the late. Were you really looking forward to going back? Were you afraid that I might be accepted? I might not be accepted? Uh, I was really afraid of the family of the deceased, but uh, the advantage of things that really worked for me back then, I think it's the distance. Where the family was of the deceased in my own village, they live somewhere in Embu and I come from Nyandarwa. So the distance quite worked well for me, I think, and I still a uh, sole advantage for me up to date. But with us still, there are some of the members that I meet on the streets and uh, they say hi. As much as they can't hold a conversation, they just say hi. And you just part like that. Although, they, like, you say, I'm human, I still have that feeling of, like, the person they loved, a person they depended on, their loved one, just passed on so sadly in my hands. Mm -hmm. I feel it. And uh, at times when I see them, there's this reaction with me. I get shocked, like, what a funny nini. Mm -hmm. But better still, I thank God for my family. They really were supportive, and every time my dad was, would visit me to the prisons, there was one question I used to keep. I kept asking, Dad, when I leave this place, will you take me back to school? Because I felt like uh, here I am, I don't have anything else to do. I have a baby who is looking up, uh, up on me. There is nothing I can do. So the only thing that I felt I should do is just like to just humble myself and just go back to school. Mm -hmm. Through the four years that, all, there were three years, eight months that I was in remand, I just had this feeling. I wanted to go back to school. I mm -hmm. kept on reading. As a matter of fact, my interest for teaching came out when I was in prison. Mm -hmm. I would teach other inmates there inside. Uh, I would take them, you know, like there are these old ladies there, they have no, they have done nothing, they don't even know how to read. So you can imagine me with the little knowledge that I had, teaching an old mama mm -hmm. how to spell A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. So how as to we speak read. right now, Beatrice, then it means you've reintegrated very well with the society. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, because I remember I left prison in November. And uh, within between November and December, my parents and I had worked in conjunction with Faraja Fraternity, and uh, Faraja had given me a scholarship. So ours was to get a school where I would fit, and that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have that time to stay mm -hmm. back home. So I just left prison and just went back to school. All right, yeah. all right. So and as closure, Beatrice, did you ever think of you know talking to the family of the late? You know, I need to view the graveside of my husband as closure, or did you just when you left and that is how? things happened? Okay, I left and um, we did. Uh, my sister was a colleague to the deceased and uh, there was a time we tried reaching out but it, it seemed that uh, it was a little bit hostile back then but uh, today I think I'm still going to do a follow-up. Mm -hmm. I really, I, I would wish, I would really wish to have a chance to get uh, to get some uh, a chance to sit with them and let them really understand what really happened. Right. I did not have any intention because at least the whole story, uh, the, how it happened, it was really fast. All right. Yeah. All right. So Bernard, here you are. 
you have been released from committed prison? Were you looking forward to going back to the community? And were you afraid also of not being accepted? And has it been so far? Uh, to be honest, it's, it's very stigmatizing once you get out of prison, because you find that most of, your, most, most of the guys who are your friends, who are your very close friends, uh, they cease to even come. Uh, uh, to be honest, only one friend who was with me in college ever came to visit me while in prison. Mm -hmm. All the others never came. So when I came out of prison, I didn't expect much from them. So, but I knew that life would be very tough for me because mm -hmm. at the same time, while still in prison, I'd gotten a letter from the university that had been suspended. So when I came out, I was trying to see how I could go back to school to finish my, at least my degree and get a certificate. Uh, most of my friends, I would even give them a call and they would not even pick. And whenever they picked, they would tell me that they are quite busy they'll give me a call letter. Mm -hmm. So it was very tough for me. Uh, I remember uh, I would go to prison, to prison uh, institutions just to inspire the inmates. Mm -hmm. And during those visits, I met Faraja. I explained to them my story. And I told them that I had gotten a chance to go and finish my studies, but I didn't have, uh, I didn't have resources. Mm -hmm. As in the, the letter that I'd gotten from the VC, indicated categorically that we are giving you a chance to finish your studies, but we will no longer, we will, no, will not give you a, a, a accommodation. accommodation within uh -huh. the hostels. So I, I, I explained that to Faraja, they accepted my plea, and they provided for the same All right. for a whole year. And as we speak right now, you're employed. Does your employer know about your past? Did you decide, let me just be open and tell my employer, and if you told your employer, how has it been? Yeah, okay. My employer know about my story. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was quite tricky for me to before I got that chance. I'd applied for several. I'd applied for a job in in so many places, but luckily I got this chance that I have now. Mm -hmm. So after being with them for like uh, two years, that's when I decided to open up with them because mm -hmm. I didn't want a situation whereby they would hear my story from a third party. Mm -hmm. I just ordered them to get it from me, but I told them that uh, I did this because of this and this. Mm -hmm. So the chat was very positive, and they even encouraged, they gave me encouragement and told me that one day they would even give me a chance to share the story with, with, the, entire, with the entire colleagues mm -hmm. within the company. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jane, talking about reintegration, you know, I've just heard from, you know, Beatrice and Bernard how it's, it's not been easy to reintegrate, you know, with the society as, as, as they continue with their lives. So when you re help in terms of reintegration, mm -hmm. so what happens, mm -hmm. you know, like in her case, yes. you know, yes, the members of the family of the late have accepted her, but not fully. Yes. So how do you ensure that the society fully, mm -hmm. you know, totally yes. accept, okay. you know, the inmates, the former inmates? Yes. Okay, uh, now what we do, Brent, we try, it's sometimes very difficult, but what we try and do is create avenues out there in the communities, in churches, to talk about prison and life in prison and that this can happen to anyone. Uh, we have done that with very many uh, clients because some of them completely are rejected. We have had instances where people cannot go home completely, completely, so you have to relocate them to another place so that they can just have, with time it becomes easier. But some of them, immediately they leave, they'll come to our, for our offices, Jane, I have nowhere to go, I cannot go home because the issues are still very critical. I'm sure you have heard of people who have even been killed after their sentences. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't have what we call halfway homes in Kenya, where people would go for some time. We have a few run by private individuals. But for us, we just tell you, if you can't go home, then we try and get you somewhere else. We'll mm -hmm. pay for some basic rent for you mm -hmm. and trying to help you just. For how long? Uh, maximum, maximum, we say three months. Mm -hmm. And hoping in the three months, something will have happened. But fortunately, most people can still go back. That's very few that uh, don't go home. Mm -hmm. The good thing with us, we all have our homes, our local homes. Mm -hmm. So despite the fear, sometimes we'll take you. And now because the churches are coming up very, very helpful, mm -hmm. they'll actually receive you. Mm -hmm. We have just done an event in Kilifi where there were four family members in prison mm -hmm. uh, because there was a murder. The church here was involved, including the government, the MCA of the area. There was a very big function just to welcome these people. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, we had visited the area with some government officials because there's probation that also assists in 
reintegration. Mm -hmm. So it, when once they see the government and other people like us, there's some sort of you know, good feeling that, yeah, we can accept these people back. Mm -hmm. But in a place like that, there was a ceremony that was to be done, a goat was slaughtered, you know, some cultural sometimes Practice. practices have mm -hmm. to be done. But it's a big job because you have to really go there and convince these people that, yeah, this person is back home. Mm -hmm. Now they are back home, sometimes there's nothing to do. So like for that family, we had two young men who have done carpentry in prison. We get them tools to, to just start some To uh, start up yes, a new life, yes. all right. Yes. And, and you know, Beatrice, you know, we, we are bringing this conversation to an end and I'd like to give us, you know, at least two minutes each just to share our last uh, sentiments. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you it, in short, you lived with your daughter in prison until you're released, if I'm not wrong. So when your daughter grows up, have you ever questioned yourself as to whether one day you'd like to share you know, your story life with her, because at some point, perhaps she might ask you, where is dad? Um, just to correct, it's a baby boy. It's a baby boy. Yeah. All right. And uh, he really knows my story. I had, to, I had to bring in a child psychologist psych uh, to just talk to him, make him understand what really happened. And at least now he's 11, yeah, he's 11 today, and he really knows what really happened, and he really has accepted that. and. He's doing good. Mm -hmm. At first, when I disclosed this to him, it really affected even in his performance. But right now, I can tell you that he has, he has come back to, him, to himself. Mm -hmm. He has accepted that. We at times talk about it. And he knows that definitely I'll never see my dad. Mm -hmm. Although it's very painful, but I have made him understand that. And, have to, and I, the, I believe the counseling will never stop until when he gets of age. Mm -hmm. We really have to talk about it day in, day out. Mm -hmm. At least that the influence from there out. Because I remember uh, there was a time my mom told me, the boy came home and told uh, my mom, Mom, you know, and he was very young. He had just started schooling. You see, like, this, uh, this stigma that we're talking about. So he didn't stay with you in prison the entire time? No, he didn't. Okay. He Is stayed with me. You can see the child until four, four years only. Mm -hmm. after, after that, they have to go home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but at least I thank my mom and my dad really much. Because uh, when my son turned one, they took, uh, they took him. All right. Because mm -hmm. of what? But this stigma that you're talking about, it does not only come to us, we as ex-prisoners, it extends even to our families. Our parents, our siblings, like the families, no, the family is labeled like Kwahilo you see. And in fact, I was about to ask you that, like how were your parents treated? It was really hard. And my mom had even to close down her shop because of the negativities that were coming in. People would talk about so many things about prisons. And this just takes me back to the day that I went back home. You see, the people ex expected I meant to go home really machated, looking very thin and skinny. But the moment that I reappeared, it was more or less like a political lie. Mm -hmm. Around where, <laughs> yes, it Everyone was. came to see you. <laughs> you know, like, everybody was called. Yes, Mr. Lami Achiliwa. And I remember that shopping center of ours. Hey, hey. Mama, I'm telling everybody was there, the old, the aged, everybody was there waiting for me. And then the moment that I just walk like, eh, some could not even stand me, they just had to walk away. Right. Others followed me back home, they came, they prayed with us, they would, right. others would come visit, give me cash right. just for starters. All right, but, but the family of the late has accepted their own son. Okay, I wouldn't say yes or no. It's, it's a mixed feeling. Because I've never had one on all right. Mm. all right, all right. Bernard, in a minute, we're winding up. Mm, I'd like to tell the viewers that uh, we should always be ready to give others a second chance, like Faraja did, like Faraja did for me. Because uh, when I did that, I was not doing it. Uh, uh, I was not doing it. I was just doing it because I, I, I was a young man. I was so naive, I didn't know more, as in, I didn't, as, as much as I knew what the guns were used for, but at the same time, I had that greed for quick money. Mm -hmm. So, people should be ready to be giving other a second chance. Right. The university gave me a second chance, I went back, I did my degree, Farada gave me that chance, that opportunity, at least to, to, to finish my, my school uh, uh, in good time. My employer at the same time, gave me a second chance, and I'm now working. At least I'm able to foot my bills to help my, my family. Mm -hmm. So it's good to, to, forgive, the, to, to forgive the past mm -hmm. and focus on the future. All right, and, and, and Faraja, I mean, looking at hearing the stories, it means you people are transforming lives. Oh, yes. Yeah, in a minute.
just to me maybe mention, you know, there are children in prison, zero to four. In most women prisons, we have put daycare centers for these children just to be with, their, with other children, not with their mothers day and night. But I think for me, it's possibly giving the opportunity to tell Kenyans, mm -hmm. we are struggling financially because right. you have to look for funds mm -hmm. and it costs. All right. So I would wish to tell Kenyans to come out and support. Mm -hmm. We are having a dinner in November 29th mm -hmm. for Kenyans to support Kenyans because we have been getting funds mostly from the abroad from the West mm -hmm. and it's time for us as Kenyans to support, to our, support brothers, our brothers and sisters, sisters. And our children. All right, thank you so much, Jen um, Kuria, the CEO of Faraja Foundation and also Bernard Ouma and uh, a former inmate whose life has been transformed and actually employed and uh, Beatrice Muiriu, who is, uh, let me say, you're training as a teacher? Nice. As a, at the Kenyatta University. The stories, uh, you know, touching lives and it, of just accepting those who've wronged us and you know just accepting them back in the community with a lot of love tender and care bringing us uh, to the end of the first hour of uh, ktn news center